Production. Recorded live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Genesis Science Fiction Radio Show, a service of the Black Science Fiction Society.com website. Uh, today is the October 2nd, welcome to the new, the new month edition of the show, and this, uh, this is kind of a part two of last Friday's show because we were having technical problems, and we asked uh, Jeffrey to come back today and uh you know everything seems to be working quite well um i i'm i'm pretty excited about the whole thing so and and i'm uh, glad to have uh jeffrey morris back he's the uh, founder of uh, future dude entertainment he has done uh a movie we were talking about a little bit earlier before the show started and we're, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh his his experiences in filmmaking and and Jeffrey, thank you for coming back. Welcome back to the show. Sure, absolutely. Happy to be here. Um, last week, I, I honestly don't remember where we, we actually left off because I didn't get to listen to the end of the recording and see where we got cut off. But one of the things that I really wanted to get to um, this this week was, you know, the the things that you're, you know, you're you're a writer, you're a director, you, I mean, to to try to characterize the one thing that you do, there is no one thing that you do. You're you're an entrepreneurial type. You wear many many hats, doing many many different things. Um, and the first thing I kind of wanted to start off with is, you know, your your project with Ocean, and then maybe you can talk to people a little bit about. We we talked last week about how uh, Jeffrey got into film, and for those of you who didn't hear it, please. Uh, Go listen to the part one of the the interview, which is already posted. But I want to talk about, you know, the, the kind of like the meat and potatoes of actually doing a production. Um, first of all, let's let's talk about the genesis of the story. Uh, did did you come up with the story your, on your own? And then, you know, what kind of what drove the story that you came up with? Well, let's see. Okay, so um, the the basic, I said the basis of the story was, um, you know, I've I've been interested in, uh, just like I I think last week we talked a lot about space, I've been interested in, um, I've been interested in uh, underwater stuff just as much, you know, throughout my life. I'm a scuba diver. Um, I've been to the Great Barrier Reef, Cayman Islands, you know, some scuba diving places like that. And when I was a kid, I used to watch the Jacques Cousteau you know, the National Geographic specials and, you know, all that kind of stuff was really interesting to me. You know, people, you know, there have been less people to the bottom of the ocean than have been on the surface of the moon, you know, um, to the deepest depths of the ocean. You know, um, right. only about 8% of the ocean has been mapped, you know. So there's a pretty interesting possibilities down there. And I'm not talking about ridiculous sea monsters or anything. I'm just talking about literally, you know, all kinds of things, potential power sources and, uh, you know, definitely life forms that we've never seen and all kinds of things. You know, the, this, if you really think about it, more of our planet is like the ocean for the surface. More of the surface is like the ocean than it is like the land. We live on the mm-hmm. minority. We, we live on the minority of the surface, you know. Um, and it's funny because we're 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 um, we're land oriented creatures, right? But but the ocean really dominates the surface. Um, so it's fascinating to me. It's just as fascinating to go to, to another planet. And at first, I was going to do an independent feature film, and I decided that I was. Um, I knew I wanted to do a short film to kind of show what I could do as a director. And, um, you know, I had a lot of experience directing music videos and commercials um, back in the 90s. Um, and I, I really wanted to make movies. But I, I had some experience trying to pitch in Hollywood. And I, honestly, I, I just never felt like the kind of films I wanted to make were ever going to really get traction in, in the Los Angeles environment in a lot of ways. So I felt like I needed to stay out and kind of strike, on my, strike it out on my own, you know, do my own thing. So, Can I ask you a question about that? Oh, sure. Sure, sure. You know, what what was it about the environment that was inhospitable for you? Because this this is this is of interest to everybody. Um, you know, what what were your experiences and what kind of what kind of gave you um that what gave you that impression? Um, well, let's see, a couple things. Um, you know, um I was I was wanting to do realistic science fiction. So, for example, it's funny this movie just came out today, The Martian, right? And one of the right. first, one of the first uh, scripts that I ever wrote um, was called Utopia. I wrote it along with my uh, writing partner Frederick Haugen back in uh, the early 1990s. And 
we wrote the script. It was about the first colony on Mars. And it, in a lot of ways, it was a character drama that was framed with this realistic science. And we took as much realistic science about Mars as we could cram into this thing. Um, and we put it together. And the interesting thing is um, I pitched it around Hollywood, and I was able to get it to Ridley Scott. And Ridley Scott actually optioned the rights to my project. And he was actually mm-hmm. going to try to produce it as a TV series. And um, But what happened was his production company at the time, um, there was a pay or play deal that he had with some actors. Um, they were doing a movie called uh, The Hot Zone based upon the book, um, The Hot Zone, a you know, virus Ebola kind of book at the time. And then that book, that, that movie, um, another rival film called Outbreak went into production. And so they started rushing the two productions to try to beat each other. And, um, the actors who were signed with, with, uh, um, with Ridley, um, they didn't like how the script was turning out. So they walked and he had to pay them and it was millions and millions of dollars. And, uh, then wow. his film fell apart and his production company fell apart and our deal fell apart along with it. <laughs> so, which was really unfortunate. So I, uh, you know, so that was that was a bit of a blow, but it was also really cool because one of my first big scripts, Ridley Scott option, I'm like friggin' Ridley Scott, you know, I mean, it's, you know, Blade Runner, Alien, you know, that told me that I was on the right path, um, mm-hmm. if, if what I was doing. But then I took the project because it reverted back to us, and I started trying to pitch it around Hollywood, and the response I kept getting was, well, where are the aliens? And I was like, well, there aren't any, <laughs> you know, there, there's, you know, if you look at pictures on Mars, there's no you know, there's not, there's nothing like that there, you know, or, or when are you going to have some space battles or when are you get, you know, it, everything kept going back to the same old sort of tried, tired um, conventions. And, and everyone kept wanting that from my stories. And I was like, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to write stories like that. I want to write realistic stories. I, I think that it's interesting to be, I think it's be interesting to be on Mars and survive on Mars. Why do you have to add things that aren't really there to make it believable and interesting, you know? But in the 1990s, it was it was virtually impossible to pitch that, you know. So a lot, and then also one of the things I ran into, um, one of the, another story I had, um, it was called Maelstrom, and it was about um, uh, weather manipulation, and uh, uh, it was about a group of people who kind of found out that they 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 were. It was kind of interesting because I I had studied a little bit about global warming at the time, and I decided I wanted to write a story about somebody who was causing climate change and then who was going to produce the same actual device to offer to fix it, right? So they were, they were <laughs> sure. an attempt to destroy the environment, but then say, oh, man, things are getting so bad. Look at what's happening. Hey, by the way, we've got this thing that can fix it. And that story was um, – and it had all kinds of huge disasters, all kinds of things that were going on, and battles, you know, uh, in, in an eye of a hurricane and all kinds of things that were going on. It was a really cool story. Um, and I actually was able to get that one to James Cameron. But the response I got back was everyone was like, well, this is a really good story, but it's too expensive. We couldn't do the visual effects. And, you know, we didn't the, – the, the visual effects capability really didn't exist at the time. As a matter of fact, I remember the, the year that I um, – the year after I, I had that script rejected, uh, Twister came out. And I was like, oh, man, see? <laughs> it's like <laughs> the technology could actually be there to do this, you know? And, but, it, but it was ideas I had. And, you know, the thing I kept hearing – um, when I was out there in the 90s was, you're ahead of your time, you're ahead of your time, you're ahead of your time, you know, and that's what people, and I, I was like, what does that mean, you know, but it, I think it, in essence, they were saying the, the kind of ideas that I had, the kind of perspectives I had, one, the, tech, the visual effects technology didn't exist to do some of the ideas that I had, but then two, um, I think that I was ahead of my time in terms of being able to reach audiences with these sort of realistic science fiction stories, I think those are two things, you know, and I think from, and I know you probably wonder about where it was on a race issue, side now and I will I will share one one aspect that I ran into out there that was very frustrating that I um I kept having people you know Spike Lee was very popular at the time and I kept having people want to they would try to push me into this so I guess you're going to be the next Spike Lee I have meetings and they say that I go no I'm actually trying to be the next Steven Spielberg you know and Mm -hmm. that was that was an interesting thing because you know being a black filmmaker director in Hollywood pitching Hollywood at the time there was definitely a a feeling and expectation that, you know, I was going to um, do quote unquote black movies. And I, mm-hmm. you know, that, that wasn't an interest of mine at all and nothing against, you know, movies that are oriented that way, but I, it just wasn't my, I want to make movies for everybody, you know, and I, I felt like I had the right to do that, you know? So that was one thing that was very, um, there was a little bit of a challenge back then to try to do that. And I'm not saying it isn't a challenge today too. Um, I, I haven't personally run into it recently. 
in terms of the, the race issues. As a matter of fact, I feel like um, the experiences I've had in Hollywood have, um, in the last couple of years have been extremely um, positive and very um, people have been very receptive. But but I, I work with the production community. I haven't been doing a lot of work with the um, you know the studio side of things. I, when I'm dealing with the, the people on the stage and I'm making independent film, um, I, I feel tremendously. Um, I've had a tremendously enthusiastic reception for me and my work and my style and my approach to filmmaking. I think that's been fantastic. So I think that some of those things have changed. It's a, it's a younger crowd. It's a different crowd. Um, and then even the people that I work with out there who are older now, they seem to be um, a lot more um, uh, positive and seasoned and they, they want to, they want to see things happen and progress. So, you know, now the studio side of things, I have a different opinion about that. And we can talk about that later. So, um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that was kind of a start. That's a start to the answer to the question. I um, to get to Oceanus, um, I wanted to make uh, films about the underwater environment, and uh, and I think I kind of skipped back to the, the Martian and everything because, uh, or or the Ridley Scott experience because the kind of films I wanted to make, um, it just there wasn't a lot of room for them back then. So what I did, um, I I was going to make a space movie for my independent short, you know, I got my financing for my company and I knew we, we wanted to start showing what we could do with um, live action, just like we did mm-hmm. animation with Parallel Man. Um, sure. And I was going to, I was going to do a space movie and I was going to do something about a couple and I was going to do something about, you know, a, a married couple and sort of this sort of tragic thing about them going on these uh, space missions where they were, um, they were uh, in suspended animation and then um, they would travel to different moons in the solar system and study them and that kind of thing and stuff like that. But then what they, one of them dies and, you know, they, the other one has to figure out what they're going to do and that sort of thing. It's going to be this little sort of short film tragedy thing. And I thought about it for a while and I was like, you know, there's so many space movies or these shorts about space and these things. It's just, it's like, who cares? I'm like, I got to do something different. So I was like, I, you know, I think I want to do something underwater. And I had this IP idea that I developed a couple of years earlier called Oceanus, which was about an underwater city. And about an underwater city that, due to a, a global disaster, is basically cut off from the surface. And I thought it'd be interesting to sort of look at this story over the period of maybe many uh, many different timetables. You know, it's so like mm-hmm. if you had a, a disaster that was on such a scale. Um, you know, we talked last week a little bit about you know that the whole um, apocalyptic thing is a little old, but I think audiences it, it we're in a place right now where people want to see things rebuilt. They 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 wonder how we're going to fix it in the current system. So I thought, okay, cool. What if I tell a story that's set in these different time periods where you get to see um, an underwater civilization that maybe is forced to start in the 21st century, but then what is it like if you've lived underwater for a thousand years or 500 years or a thousand years, that kind of thing. Um, And this was kind of the start of it. And so I pitched it to the story to my wife, Kimberly, and she and I started talking out sort of different ideas around it and everything. And we also worked with another guy, a guy named Christopher Jones, who I, uh, artist who I respect a lot, who did um, uh, the art for Parallel Man. He's actually drawn Batman and uh, a lot of other really cool comics. Anyway, um, uh, we, he and I, we kind of talked it out. And then while we started working on the, the basic concept, um, we did a lot of drawings of what a submarine could look like in the story. Because I thought, you know, to save money, we should set the, the film in one location with a small sure. number of characters. And then we thought, you know, I'm going to bring over this idea of this married couple. And then my wife and I started talking about this idea of like, well, what if we, we took the relationship dynamic that you usually see in movies and TV shows and we turned it on its ear where you said, you know, instead of the, the woman sort of pining for the cold, distant man, what if it's the man who actually has the emotions and the woman who is much more driven and cold and, you know, and he's, he's feeling for her. He's wanting her, you know, and he's trying to get her to mm-hmm. do they've got something. And I thought that was really interesting. That's something you don't see. Um, and, and I also wanted to create a really strong character arc that could happen over a very short span of time of, you know, 20 to 30 minutes where you could really get engaged with the characters, care about them, and then really, really wonder what's going to happen to them. So, so all that was what we did. We tried to base that story, but then simultaneously we intentionally did designs and drawings and storyboards and everything along with developing the story so that they, they happen simul- they, they happen together. So, so we were able to figure out how to keep it interesting and keep it moving and flowing and exciting um, while staying in that one set. You know, so that was, that, was, that was the benefit of doing all the art and direction and design work at the exact same time as writing the script. And, um, and that's very much like how I like to work because I, you know, because I am an illustrator and I am, I am into design. Um, it, uh, it, it's a big advantage I feel because I don't, I don't write anything that I can't, I can't put on the screen. 
You know, because the third thing that I do is I, as a producer, I try to look at the budget. So there are ideas we might have, and I'll go, well, that's a good idea, but you know what, I think that's going to cost too much. So, you know, I'm going to scale that back, and I'm going to – so then I'll sketch it out, and I'll go, okay, maybe it'll work this way, and then I'll change the script. You know what I mean? So it's like mm-hmm. I, integrate, mm-hmm. I integrate producing with designing with writing all at the same time. Those are all kind of happening simultaneously as I develop the script, which is part of why – you know, all those people out there who, who send me submissions going, hey, will you make my movie? And all of a sudden, it's like, I've got so many movies I want to make and ideas I want to make. I, I can't, I, I don't have any time to do anybody else's, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, yeah, but, um, so, I, I mean, we'll be long-winded, but that's, you know, that's kind of how I got to the beginnings of Oceanus. You know? um, I, I have not downloaded and watched it, and only because I've been really, really busy this week, but, um, in in terms of uh, how, how long is it right now? Um, it's it's thirty four minutes. Yeah, thirty four minutes, including the um, thirty four minutes, including uh, the uh, credits. Okay, and and what was your budget for it? If you don't mind um, saying, we did it for um, uh, you know, it's, it's around three quarters of a million dollars, somewhere in there. You know, I mean, it's it's. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, all in on what we've done with the IP, you know, it's about a million bucks on the IP itself. You know, we've got a graphic novel, we've got a soundtrack, we've got a lot of things out there, Blu-rays, you know, things like that. But, you know, the movie itself, eh, between half a million, three quarters of a million dollars, you know, somewhere in there. And uh, that was obviously with a lot of deferrals and a lot of help and a lot of a lot of uh, people who, you know, I've got to really shout out to Hydraulic Studios, the guys who did, uh, they do a lot of visual effects for movies and stuff, and they were fantastic. Um, they were incredibly supportive of what we were trying to do, and they they really came through for us. We we had their sound stage and their uh, their video assist their system called a Q Take, which let us watch the actual um, playback, you know, right there in in high def on the stage, sure. <laughs> so we could actually see what the movie looked like. You know, it was fantastic. And so that you know, we shot over eight days, and it was actually um, where we shot last fall, um, right? Actually about a year ago. Um, we, we, we built the set in Vancouver and mm-hmm. uh, I had some guys who worked on Battlestar Galactica and a couple other shows who were some buddies of mine and um, they figured out a way to really um, uh, take my design for the set and turn it into something really, really cool and tangible. And we did this kind of this neat 3D foam system where we actually were able to take this foam. It's, it's kind of like 3D printing, but it's like the reverse where you take a huge block and then you whittle it down to this and then they sure. cleaned it out and they take it, you know, so we were able to build this set that looked like it cost a ton of money. Um, but we, we did it with this lightweight, but very durable foam. And so then mm-hmm. we took the foam parts, we, we put them in a truck, we shipped them down to LA, we had a steel um, framework and we, we assembled the, the, the parts for the set on top of the framework. And then we, then we painted it, detailed it, added monitors, computer graphics, this is, uh, this uh, great artist that I work with, this guy's name is uh, Emil Petrinic and he's uh um, Emil is um, he's based out of uh, Alameda, California, and he um, he and I were friends for a long time, and you know, kind of off of Facebook. But he turns out, you know, he's a great computer graphic artist, so he came down, and he uh, he helped do all the uh, the graphics on the stage for the the uh, 3D graphics, and we played, we did everything live act live on the set. So that gave it a when you watch the movie, you'll see it. it it's very real. It feels very real because all of our monitors have these 3D graphics that are playing real time, and so mm-hmm, the actors. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not added in post. We didn't do any of that in post. We did it all live on the stage, which, which I, I, it was important to me. Like I said last week, I, I don't like those video game movies. That's what I call them. You know, I, I didn't want my actors to feel like they were inside of um, a video game. I wanted them to feel like they actually could switch switches and turn knobs and grab things and twist them and look at monitors and see things for real. You know. So. Right. Um. And and so you know you you. Uh, you said you had a very short uh, shooting schedule. Um, how, how long did you spend in post-production? Well, post-production took a while. When you watch the movie, you'll see because the, uh, the visual effects that we have are, um, you know, we were never, ever underwater. And, you know, the, the entire movie's in this shot in a soundstage. But the, uh, um, what we did with it, I think, was just uh, amazing because we, we did this interactive lighting on the set, on the stage that um, that really made it seem like we were underwater. We did all kinds of reflections and, and shimmers and things like that. And then when you couple mm-hmm. that with the computer, with the computer graphics, uh, the computer, it looked fantastic. It looked it literally looks like they're underwater. There's not one scene where you don't think they're really underwater. And so I had, I had two visual effects uh, supervisors that I worked with, a guy named Ryan, Ryan Weber, who is uh, 
Um, I don't know if you've ever seen those great uh, lightsaber battles that that uh, these guys do, they, like these <laughs> these kind of um, fan made lightsaber battles. He he, one of the most famous ones. He was the guy who created them, uh, created it, and he's a visual effects artist who worked on Heroes, a few other things. So the guy's really talented, and he he came in and did a lot of work, you know, kind of figuring out how to rotoscope everything and make it look real. And then the other, the exterior shots were done by Tobias Richter, who is a uh, a uh, German visual effects artist who does a lot of Star Trek stuff, a lot of Star Trek fan films and different things. He, he did the effects on Star Trek Axanar, a few other things. And uh, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, and so we wanted to work together. So he came in and did all the on all the exterior underwater stuff. So so we started our post. I had the rough cut finished within, I don't know, a week and a half after the movie was shot. And then I uh, I took that rough cut and got it off to the visual effects artist. And then we were we were cranking out. We, we I don't know, this film probably had about 600 visual effects shots you know, and in a 30 minute film, about 600 shots. And we, um, that took until <clears throat> oh, December or so, you know, so we, 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 October, November, December, part into January. Sure. And then we did, um, our, we did, um, in late January, February, we did all of our sound effects work and, um, our composer, Jeff Rona did the uh, soundtrack, got that done. Jeff did a fantastic job. Our soundtrack is just, I mean, people go nuts over our soundtrack. I mean, I, it's really a big deal actually. Um, and so the, uh, um, all that came together, and we put it together and uh, finished post at, uh, end of February, beginning of March this year. So I think it, so about a little less than six months of, of post on it. Um, you know, so it was it was a lot to get the visual effects done, and really, really, you know. But we figured out how to. But do that's it. that's yeah. still that's still a very I mean that's a very an effectively short amount of time that you guys did that in, and and I think. I think probably the most credit, at least it sounds to me, goes to, you know, your previous networking, the relationships you had with other people, and being able to pull in really, really good people who are interested in the project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing, I mean, I had, I, okay, so think about it. I mean, it's like from when I started the idea, the idea formulated starting in May of 2014. Okay. We, we wrote the script and did the initial design work in, in June of 2014. We were building the set starting we did, July and August. We built the set and did the costumes. Uh, I had I had Global Effects do the costumes. They were the same guys who did like the spacesuits for um, the movie uh, Deep Impact, Europa Report. Uh, they they built okay, the limbs sure. for the movie Apollo 18. Um, they they built the um, uh, they did the spacesuits for Serenity, uh, Firefly Serenity. Uh huh. You know, so I had those guys too. So like I I had a really cool group of people. I even had like. Uh, I I, rep, I got uh, over the summer. I met with um, a couple of astronauts about uh, who who did a lot of Navy work and and who are you know formerly from the Navy and stuff. We talked a lot about you know procedures and how vehicles like this might work and function and, and everything. Um, I got to meet with uh, Story Musgrave, who is a space shuttle astronaut who uh, who repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. He and I had lunch and talked about the movie. And there's like all kinds of cool things. And Andy Probert, uh, Andrew Probert, who who uh, designed the Enterprise refit for uh, Star Trek mm-hmm, motion mm-hmm. picture, and he also designed the Enterprise D um, for Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, he, uh, I showed him the initial designs of the Aqua Shuttle for the movie um, uh, back when I was first designing it, and he kind of gave me his two cents on it. So, you know, and, and then I had Darren Docterman, who is a great visual effects artist who worked on uh, on the Star Trek The Motion Picture uh, Special Edition, a ton of movies, AI, all kinds of stuff. He built the 3D model, the initial 3D models of the Oceanus base and the submarine stuff. So I, I kind of reached out to all these different people that I respected in the industry. And what was really cool is I felt like they kind of, they saw what I was doing and they respected me back. <laughs> and we worked together. Um, you know, Eric Chu, the guy, he, he designed the Battlestar Galactica for the, uh, um, the new, the, you know, the reboot TV series. And, and the mm-hmm. Cylons, he designed that. He was the guy who actually su- um, was involved in supervising the construction of the sub. You know, so I, I reached out to all these kind of cool dudes who were into this, and they were all like, man, no one's doing underwater. This is awesome, you know, and that, that, that was really cool. So that's, so I guess we were, so I guess to finish out my timeline, we had the set f- finished in September, and we were shooting right. the last week of September into October, and <clears> then <throat> our post took us from there. So that was the, that was the whole schedule for the film. So. And, and for everybody listening, that's for a 30-minute movie, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's a lot more work than people think it is, you know. Um, but, I, you know, knowing what I know about production work, I, I marvel at how much you got done. But now, you know, now that you've described 
the kind of people who were attracted to the project. I mean, it makes perfect sense that not only did you do it in a in a relatively short amount of time and and for a decent budget, but you know you you got better than average quality out of the people you were doing just by virtue of your networking skills. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, it was really important to me, like I said, to get great people and people I respected, you know. And and the other thing is, a lot of these guys, almost all of them, when I talk to them. It, amazingly, a lot of them, they're kind of dissatisfied with the industry. And they're all going, man, we want to work on something cool. We want to work on something different. We want to work on something meaningful. You know, that was the thing I kept hearing over and over and over again. So it was, it, we had a lot of people donating time and energy and effort into this because they saw it as something that was really special and that was different than what was typically being done. You know, so yeah. that was really exciting. And, and it was and, also and, a real honor. It was a real honor. I got to work with a lot of heroes of mine, you know. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, but see, they're they're interested in the product, and every single one of those guys you worked with had had their ass canceled, had a series canceled out from under them for no other reason than maybe a drop in, you know, a point oh four share. You know, think about mm-hmm. how many people. I mean, you think about everybody who works in Vancouver. If you want to work in sci-fi, you can go and be an actor in Vancouver and be in every single one of those damn shows. But the problem is, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's, you know, it's funny that you say that because I've, I've said that. To, I just said this to my wife the other day. I was like, "Hey, there's like these actors, and they're in all of the Vancouver shows. It's like, hey, there's another Vancouver sci-fi actor. You know, it's like they're all. You know, it's it's kind of funny how that said. Yeah, absolutely, totally noticed that. But but here's the thing: none of those guys get any long-term work. I That's mean, let's true. let's talk about let's talk about the average stars sci-fi. Uh, whomever a series you get, and and basically they are lucky if they get over five um, over five uh, not years I can't seasons you know of, no, sure, of work sure. on on any one series and yeah. and it's funny because and, and they they recycle those sons of guns for every series I mean I I have a very very good friend who lives in Vancouver who I keep threatening to visit but until I get the ankle bracelet off I got to stay kind of close to house to the house um but you know I ju- I just imagine going to Vancouver walking down the street and every single one of those actors I'm going to bump into one or two of them in a day you know mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. but 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 the but the high end tech people that you talked about they have worked on all those series. They've worked on all of those series and watched them get yanked, even yeah. though those series had legs. Okay, yeah, a, a, a lot of those series had legs, but and and usually it's either sci-fi or Fox. They decide that when it drops just this little infinitesimal bit, um, to to bail. Mm-hmm. And and that's another reason why it's awfully hard for for someone like you, as creative as you are, to get. Um, people to take you seriously for for a, a, a science fiction or a speculative fiction um, series that doesn't have any BEMs, you know? I'm sorry, yeah. bug-eyed monsters. Yeah. Um, yes, I know. Yeah, mm-hmm. where, where where are the monsters? Where are the aliens? Where where's the where's the uh, the spaceship battle? Where 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 where? And basically, all they want is recycled, very safe memes. That people get bored, and, and, and it works to their disadvantage because people get bored with the same crap all the time. Yes. I'll tell you a crappy movie that surprised everybody. Okay, this movie shocked everybody by how many people went to see it, what kind of buzz it generated, and it was a crap-ass movie. It was such a crap-ass movie when they made the sequel in, of the same sort, they, they, didn't, they didn't get the traction that they wanted, but that was the Blair Witch Project. And the mm-hmm. only reason it got that buzz was it was a, it, it was something brand new that they hadn't seen. Right. Well, if they can't get something that's so remarkably brand new instead of something that's very strongly character-driven where people are going to fall in love with what's going on like they did with Firefly, if they hadn't shown the Firefly episodes out of order, um, you know, the, the audience would have built rather than been disjointed, you know? So, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, um, if you think about it, that's, see, that's part of my problem. It's like I... I what I'm literally trying to do right now, so I'm trying to figure out how to make a, a you know, I'm working on financing the feature film of Oceanus. I, you know, finished the screenplay for the 
Um, my wife and I finished that in uh, June of this year, and we've been we did a budget schedule, and we've been doing pre-production design, designing sets, designing everything for the feature. Um, and then we want to bring our actors back. You know, we were lucky. I, I want to actually also I need to give a shout out to the actors who were in Oceanus. We, I got to work with um, uh, Bruce Davison, who is one of my all-time favorite actors. You know, he was in uh, he's an Oscar. He's uh, done a uh, or he's a, the God of Act, I guess he's a nominee, uh, Academy Award nominee for Young Time, Long Time Companion. He um, he was uh, um, Bruce Davison's in X Men, a bunch of stuff. Guy's awesome. He's great. He's in one of my favorite episodes of Battlestar Galactica. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he played a doctor on that show. It was really cool. And then I got to work with Sharif Atkins, who is another actor that I really admired. He, was, uh, he played Michael, the intern, on uh, the show ER back in the 90s. And he's been recently on shows like White Collar and a bunch of he's, – he's, like you know, he's like one of those stable TV actors in a lot of TV right. shows. Right. He's a good character he's, actor, and, he's a great and he, character he, br- actor. he brings it. Yeah, he brings yeah, it. Yeah, he brings it. He really does. And I had a blast <laughs> working with him, and it was really cool. And then um, the real surprise was Megan Dot, who, um, for me, she's my Ellen Ripley. You know, she was she was my you know strong <laughs> female lead, and she uh, you know, she'd previously been the villain in the movie Ever After, and she was uh, she's been in CSI, a few other shows. She's less well known. Um, she's done a lot more stage type stuff, but she uh, she did a fantastic job, a phenomenal job in the film. And, uh, you know, and that was really, really cool. And to have she and Sharif did a great job together. They had real chemistry. They, they, they played it well on the screen. It worked really well. So that was great. So anyway, I'm looking to bring the three of them back, and then we're working to, um, to also bring on a couple of A-list actors um, to join them in the feature. Um, right. And, you know, so, and the feature is going to just pick up right where the, the short ended. And so what will happen is the, fe- the feature will include the short, we're going to actually shoot a couple more scenes that we would add to the to the first 30 minutes, and then that right. will become. That's why we call it Oceanus Act One because it'll be Act One of the feature film, and then we have we're we're shooting another 90 minutes, and my goal is to go into production with that, you know, um, solid heavy pre-production early next year, and then production by no later than next summer with the visual effects and everything, um, you know, um, with the goal of releasing either uh, spring of 2017 or you know um, August 2017. So. Um, with Have with you, our post schedule, it'll probably be August 2017. But you know, yeah, right. Well, you never know. Yeah. Um, you never know. Uh, yeah. Look, dude, I I I put off doing our feature for a year, <laughs> and I could use the money. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna lie. But I mean, you you just don't know. Do you have a, a a like a projected budget for the feature? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So do you mind telling yeah. us? No, all ballpark. All in, we're looking to probably we got a lot more sets we have to build. All in, we're looking around. This will be about a ten million dollar film, you know. But but if you look at the short and you see what we did with it visually, there's very few people, especially industry professionals, that see that they don't think we spend many several million dollars on it, you know. And so the the goals I have for this, I mean, this feature is going to have, it's got robots, it's got um, it's got. Uh, drones it's got underwater submarine battles it's got you know it's got a lot of cool interesting character things developments and stuff it's it's got twists and turns and things you don't expect um so it's uh it's going to be a lot of fun and and you know um learning from what we did from the visual effects of the first film the short i think we can really really deliver a, an action packed movie that uh that also has some really interesting character um, arcs and development to it. It's going to go places you don't at all expect it to go, which is what I'm really excited about. So when you, the people who have watched the short, you know, and then read the script were pretty surprised at, at, at right. what my, my wife and I came up with for it. So we went, we, we went, and we, and we also went old school. You know, we, we, we really looked at movies that we, we dug in the past and we said, you know, well, what made these movies great and how can we make a movie that we would really enjoy you know, or, or would have been excited to watch back in 1977, 78, sure. you know, or, yeah. yeah, that's, you know, with today's visual effects. So. Well, and, and not, not only that, but I mean, when you look back at, at especially that period of time, when you're looking at science fiction, um, you, you're looking at, yeah, you have your, you know, your bug-eyed monsters, but there are actually better defined characters you know there's a three-dimensionality to the characters that you don't you really don't see much of today you know you you see so many very very familiar tropes and you see very very familiar character types you know Mm -hmm. like like and and so 
I think that you may actually generate something that's that's got a little more longevity and and may draw people in a little bit better because you know if you're going to go back to that style of of storytelling you're probably going to engage your audience a little bit better. That's my goal with it. Yeah, I mean and it's interesting because we we pitched it. We we've actually pitched a few Hollywood studios about the possibility of, of partnering, you know, um more than right. independent studios in LA. And it's interesting because the response we're getting is, well, this isn't like this, you know, we're not getting, you don't have that big idea in here. You don't have that. that <laughs> and, and, you know, it's really interesting. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, well, no, I don't. I, that wasn't what we were doing. We're, we're, we're taking our characters. We're following through a, a, an intelligent, thoughtful adventure. You know, I'm not, I don't want to have a big, dumb idea at the core of it. You know, it's like, oh, and we found out that at the center of the earth, it's going to implode, and then there's a black hole. And it's like, I, no, I'm not, that's not what we're doing. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's written a lot more like a Tom Clancy-style story or a, right. uh, you know, um, Robert Ludlum. You know, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's one of those – it's a thriller in a way. You know, it's like a science fiction mm-hmm, thriller. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what our story is. It starts off, this first act is kind of a – it's a, a, a bit of a love story with action in it and some character drama, but then it's going to turn into a thriller with, with some strong characters. That's what we're really doing. So yeah. I think, I think, and so what I this basically saying is like, you know what? I, I just, at the end of the day, I'm probably just not meant to work in that system <laughs> because I just, you know, I, I don't, I really don't, I, it's going to sound terrible. Yeah, I got to be careful. <laughs> um, I guess my point is, is that I, I believe in what we're doing. And I believe that there's a type of movies, uh, a type of film that there are people like me and like you want to see. And I think that there are millions of us out there. And, right. and I think the question is finding us and getting us to, you know, you know, the model, I don't know if I said this last week or not, but it's a strange thing to compare it to, but I want to be kind of the, you know, when people said you, you, you want to be Spike Lee, like in a way I want to be Tyler Perry. And what I want to say is I don't want to make movies like Tyler Perry. But what I like about what Tyler Perry has done is that he, he knows his audience and he's made specific type of movies for his audience and he's been incredibly Absolutely. successful making and delivering those films for that audience. And that audience comes out for him time after time after time. That's what I want. I want to find a, an audience, a diverse audience of, of you know, all kinds of people, smart people um, who want to see movies that are intelligent science fiction dramas that didn't have to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but that have great characters, great actors, great stories, cool special effects, you know, and that just feel kind of old school. And you know what? Those movies are not going to compete with the, with the Marvel films. My films are not going to compete with, with Transformers. My films are not going to complete, compete with Jurassic World. They're not meant to, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do something new. I want to do something that people haven't seen yet. That's, well, that's here, kind of here, here's here's the thing. You know, uh, people are making fun of me in the chat room about my my views on Tyler Perry. I I have never said that Tyler Perry is a bad person. I have said that Tyler Perry goes after his low low hanging fruit, which is yes. absolutely true. The dude is filling his niche, and every time he makes a movie, he can almost count to the to the uh, million millionth dollar what he's going to be pulling in. You know, Absolutely. I, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I I would like to see something a little. No, you know what? I take it all back. Let Tyler Perry do do what Tyler that's, Perry. That's that's kind of how I look at it. And, is, is like and then video. and then let you do what you do, and let me exactly. do what I do. Because here's the thing: um, if, if we do, if we produce well enough, and that means tell a good story. And and have it visually compelling because that's really well visually and oral a u r, you know the the sound make the sound compelling and I don't mean loud like Pacific Rim that was the loudest damn movie I ever heard in my life but but yeah. if we make those kinds of movies for for our audience eventually and the challenge obviously is to alert the audience that we did something. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, that's, that's exactly the challenge. Right. But here's the cool thing. There are more and more film festivals, and there are more, you know, people, the, the people who are running the film festivals, the best film festivals, you know, uh, um, you know Redford, all of those people, they, they now are looking for 
the best of the independents. And the reason why they're doing that is because the big studio stuff has worn out its welcome. It's, you know, it's the, it, it, excuse me for saying so, but it's the same shit different day. And, mm-hmm. and that, that's, not as com- that's not as compelling as it was. Yes, you are always, well, they, they're expecting two more Avenger movies. They're going to do two more. And then they're going to mm-hmm. have to recycle the heroes because, you know, folks get old. But, but the fact of the matter is they've got that built-in audience. Tyler Perry has his built-in audience. Yeah, what we I, need to do is to find Jeffrey's audience. That's and then exactly maybe there'll be right. some there'll be some spillover between Jeffrey and my audience because we're looking for the same people. You and I are looking for the same people. And yeah. and so that's that's the challenge, but I think it's the challenge is getting less and less. And let me tell you why. Um the internet has become a great equalizer. You know, look what you've done with Oceanus. Eventually you're gonna pop that up, something's gonna go viral with that, and they're gonna go, Oh my god, you know, I gotta see what happens next. That's ex- I mean, that's the bait you threw out there, and that's what you want to do. You want to tell that compelling story so people come back to you, you know? And I yeah, don't mean bait exactly. in a bad way. I, no, I no, mean no. Bait, bait like wetting somebody's appetite. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, think that, I think that your path is golden, to be honest with you, Thanks. because what you're doing is you're, you have decided this is what I want to do. I am not going to write and produce something just because that's how so-and-so told me that, you know, it should be. Or because everybody's asking, where's the underwater aliens? Or, you know, what, does Godzilla actually come up out of the ice? Or, you know, there's some nonsense like that. But, but there's, we've watched it time and time again where people will go and see a very smart movie that is realistic and I think science fiction obviously is going to always always fill a niche for, for the what if people. Yeah. You know, you're, what you're doing is, hey, what if this happened? What if what if the surface was messed up and everything happened had to happen underwater? Well, the fact that it has to happen underwater makes it science fiction. But like you said, it's a compelling drama. It's a drama and a mystery. Yeah. Um, and so. You know, it's funny because we're, we, we've done the same damn thing. I did it in writing. I, I, wrote, I wrote something that I thought was compelling. What if black folks had secretly, some black folks secretly moved to the moon and nobody mm-hmm. knew? You know, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to create some sort of sci-fi adventure, but, but it's a drama. And someone else reviewed it as a cross between Michael Crichton and, and Robert Ludlum. Well, mm-hmm. that's perfect. That's perfect mm-hmm. because, okay, you know, Michael Crichton, well, what if we could find DNA and we could make dinosaurs? Cool idea. And, and, and how great was the timing of the special effects to be able to show on film that dinosaurs exist? Pretty oh, cool. Yeah. Great Absolutely. timing. Absolutely. Um, and, and so these, you know, the film, filmmakers like you, and, and to a, a much, much lesser extent me because mine is going to be um, – Mine's a little more mainstream. Mine's basically mm-hmm. a bank heist movie, but but you you have to have the courage of your conviction and the strength of your conviction, which you already have. You've demonstrated that you have, and Thanks. and you have to go ahead and do what you're going to do, and and not hope, but know that your audience is out there. Your audience is out there. You already know your audience. Yeah, no. You, I mean, that's you, thing. Every, like, every single person yeah. in your life, you know whether they're going to like your movie or not, but the Absolutely. people that you know are going to, they're going to go, oh, shoot, this sounds great. Okay? Yeah. I'm going to go see your stuff. You know, I'm going to download right. the short. I'm going to wait for you to do your stuff. I'm going to look at some production stuff. You know, if you ever wanted, you know, like a, a, an old-ass Japanese Negro to do a cameo in there, you can always call me. Um, All right, I'll, I'll, I'll keep but, it in mind. <laughs> but but seriously, <laughs> on the serious side, it you your path is set out perfectly well. I mean, and I don't I don't mean that to blow any smoke, but but I think that if you stick with what you want to do, your audience is going to find you. You know, yeah. if, if 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 and and you have to stick with that instead of going. Oh shoot! Okay, all right, so. So they already had Mothra and they had Rodan. What monster can I get for Godzilla now? That's just not going to work for you, you know, yeah. because it, your science fiction is grounded in science. 
not so much, you know, and your fiction is not, it's not bug-eyed monsters. Um, no. So I, 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 I kind of, I, I think it's going to do well once it's done. You, you have a realistic budget, and looking at how you spent your money the first time around, I mean, obviously you're, you're not going to release something that's not going to look good, and you're going to, um, you're going to get what you need out of your professionals. And and you know yeah. what? They're going to give you more than you pay for because they're going to believe in your project. So I, I see nothing but good things ahead for this, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think we've got it. I think we'll, we'll be able to pull it off. I, I, I know we can. And uh, and I also appreciate what you're saying in getting – because I, I feel the same way you do. I mean, it's like I said, nothing against Tyler Perry at all. I, I'm just not his audience. You know, I'm, I'm not as no, honest, no, but, but he's do. filling a niche. I mean, the but, dude is but, yeah, right, I mean, he, exactly. Yeah, and you know what? Those people, those people deserve to have movies they want to watch, just like people like us deserve to have movies we want to watch. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, and so it's like I'm. My main thing is I just want to stop trying to see movies that I don't. You know, it's like all these times I go to the movie theater, I'm just rolling my eyes and I'm going, I yeah, looking at my watch. I'm like, you know. When can I get out of here? You know, watching something like a Star Trek Into Darkness or something. It's like, oh my, you know, it's like, when can I, when is this going to be over? You know, and I, I, whoa, I, I whoa, want, whoa, I want whoa, to whoa, 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 whoa. Where if we if we don't have movies like that, where are we going to get our lens flares? <laughs> That's true. They, you know, I think there might have been about ten years worth in there though. So oh, jeez. I, I think that uh, I think we did all right. I think we did all right on that. So. And and the but, bridge uh, of the Enterprise looked like uh, what? It looked like an Apple store. You know what oh I mean? Oh my God! I, wouldn't you go nuts in there? I I would I, I would. How could anyone work in a place like that? It's it, 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 I don't it doesn't it. I don't understand what's going on at all. I don't I don't get it at all. And it, it, like when we could do a whole show about J.J. Abrams Star Trek, but it's not worth doing. So anyway. and, or, or just <laughs> bad visual. But you know, a lot of people put a lot of flash like that in there because they don't have story. That's You're going to be thing. the opposite. You don't have to put that kind of flash in your story because you have a story. That's 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 exactly what I'm trying to do. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. And that's like I said, that's why I think I've gotten some of the responses I've had to to my script and um, you know for the full feature in L.A. with the studios that, that I've pitched because it's it's not a flash story. It's just not. Right. It's not not it's not a you know simple you know bug eyed monster story. It just isn't. You know so. Um, you know, so, but, but by the same token, it's, it's, you know, okay. I, something I should say about our movie that's been really exciting is that Oceanus has, um, we've had lots and lots of women like the short. I mean, I actually think we've had more women like the short than men and, and the women who have liked it, we hear consistently, they say, I don't like science fiction and, but I like this. I've had tons of women say that. I don't really like sci-fi. I hate sci-fi, but I really like this. That was really cool to me. You know, that was that's something that's been really, really exciting. And and you know, and I think being able to, you know, not only do I believe we can hit a new, hit our core audience of people in our Tyler Perry fashion, but I also think we can right. expand to to some people who normally wouldn't like science fiction because it doesn't have bug-eyed monsters in it. If, if I ask those ladies, those women, they're like, why did you not like, why don't you like science fiction? A lot of people will say, well, I, I don't like, I don't like all the aliens and monsters and the funny foreheads and the, you know, the, the all this kind of weird stuff. It's like, I don't, I'm just mm-hmm, not interested mm-hmm. in that, you know? And, and I, I get it because I'm, you know, I'm with them. <laughs> it's not my thing either. And then, again, I don't mean any offense to anybody who likes that. I know a lot of people do. Hell, most people probably do, right? And I think that's fine. And it's not like I haven't ever enjoyed those sorts of movies, some of them myself, right? But at the end of the day, you got to be something new. Time for something new. Yeah, I, I, you know, something's very strange here because, you know, from what you just said, I have actually more women reading my books than men. Huh, interesting. And, well, yeah. well, there's no and. And I don't, I mean, I sort of understand it. I don't understand it as well as I should understand it. But I, I'm going to take a closer look at that now that the trilogy is done. But mm-hmm. I think that it may be, and, and you know, I'm, going to, I'm sure somebody's going to chew my ass out about this. But, and somebody mentioned that most women are very reality-based. Well, that's true, and I think that most women are, are probably maybe more interested, at least as readers, in, in a quality story. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you have compelling characters who act real instead of, you know, uh, being stereotypical and falling into you know, the most stereotypical tropes, 
I think that you're probably going to get a better read audience. And, and currently right now, I mean, statistics show that, that women read a lot more fiction than men do, and they're mm-hmm. looking at other things to read. You know, the, so you're getting, you're getting somebody looking at Oceanus, which is, you know, what you would consider sci-fi, what you and I would both consider hard sci-fi, but they're not looking at the hard sci-fi part, part about it. What they're looking at is, okay, here's a setting. doesn't matter what the setting is, you know, Dante's Inferno, whatever. But if you're telling a compelling story with good characters, you're going to get an audience. And that was something I was going to mention to you. You know, you look at a Lionsgate, you look at some of these independents, and I, I can't think of all of them right now because I'm stupid, but um, they, they are picking up more, I mean, more and more stories. I would say that 10 years ago, you couldn't have had a Silver Linings playbook made. Right. And get, and get distribution, you know. Mm-hmm. But, but you have enough of these, um, these semi-independent, smaller studio kind of environments where something, you know, something that is compelling, something that's good, will get picked up for distribution. And you know as well as I do, if, if you get a distributor who actually has foreign distribution, then everybody gets paid. You know, everybody wins financially, and that's what they're looking for. You know, okay, so you make something for 10 to $15 million, and you bring in $150 million, that's a winner for everybody. Right. You know, not everything well, has to well, be a half a billion dollar blockbuster. That, that's exactly right. It was, I was just reading, like, for example, I was just reading the other day that uh, Terminator Genesis, um, I didn't see it, but i you know familiar with it, obviously. Terminator Genesis made, uh, it cost, I think, I, I don't even know, I think it was $150 million, something like that. And it, um, yeah. And, and it made $83 million in the U.S., but it made, like, over 300 million overseas, right? Right. right. Well over 300. So the total all in on that film I think, <clears throat> was 440 or something, 440 million it made. And it's still considered a flop because of all the money they spent on promotions and all the other deals and everything that happened. So they killed that franchise this week for good. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, and so it's like it has to make 400. Wait, 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 wait. Let me just say this. Let me just say. This. So you mean he won't be back? Sorry, I have, go ahead. Please continue. <laughs> he, he, he won't be back. No, he, he won't be back. Yeah, he won't be back. So, um, yeah. So, think about that, man. You know, it's a it's a trip. I mean, he's, uh, um, you know, he's uh, um, that, that's done. It's it's done. So, um, you know, it, because it, and four hundred forty million wasn't enough. So, you know, that's another thing I'm thinking. It's like, man, I want to keep our budgets. I, I would prefer to never make a movie over $25 million. And I know Absolutely. Like, why, Absolutely. Why would you what want to do that? What a perfect price point. Yeah, yeah what a perfect but I'm price like, to point. Me, it's like, I want to keep these things under $25 million. So, what, so then what does that mean? So then that says, okay, then let me just start a type of story that I can't make. Right? There, there are stories that I have created that I'm developing that I'm not going to be selling. Uh, I'm I'm going to sell them. I'm going to sell those stories to 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 studios. That's my goal with them because these films would cost over a hundred hundred million dollars to make, but I don't want to make them. I'm not. I'm, they're good ideas, I think, but I think they're ideas for somebody else. And so that's what I'm doing with them. I'm I'm writing them up, and then yeah, I want to sell them. You know, um, right? And and but but the ones I'm going to make, I'm going to make sure we stay in that twenty five million or under zone, and and keep delivering better and better visual effects, better and better sets you know, perfect our technique and our capabilities and, and really get a stable of great actors. You know, I mean, like my second film um, that I want to do, Venus, um, it takes place on a research platform floating over the, you know, in the atmosphere of, of uh, Venus, right? And mm-hmm. I, I've already got, I already got Lance Reddick, uh, you know, from Fringe and um, The Wire and stuff. He's already signed on to star in it. And, uh, and then he's been helping me. He's actually going to be doing, he's producing some with me on the project as well. So he's going to help me bring in some other great actors. So we're going to have great actors in the movie. <laughs> you know, we're going to have some A-list actors. Um, but he's helping me pull it off and put it together. But I'm building this. This thing is going to all be modular sets. It's all taking place on a floating space platform, right? So, so everything going on outside on Venus, there is a sequence where they go down to the surface of Venus. But, you know, everything we can do it with really cool miniatures, visual effects, you know, CG, you know, that kind of thing. And, and tell a very big epic story, but it's all set within these very small sets. And I've got a number of those stories like that that are all about the characters, and, and the, but they're completely different stories. They're all very, very different, but they all take place in different parts of our solar system and different kind of environments. 
um, but they let me tell action adventure stories with a small number of characters. I think we'll be able to pull it off, you know, and 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 really uh, really do it for moderate budgets. And then the thing is, when those movies make, if they can make fifty million, a hundred million dollars, my gosh, we've got a huge win. You know, we've done really exactly. Well. Yeah. And and see yeah. those kind of stories have legs because they they carry to other countries and translate very well. Mhm. You know? Um yeah. because they're 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 universal humanistic stories. So yes. if 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 you get that reputation with your first movie or your second movie that you you're you're telling those kinds of stories, then you will always get distribution because foreign distribution pays the cost of production. Yes. Yes. Um, so that's that's going to be great. Um, so let's let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, you mentioned you've got Venus. Um, you know you you want to stay within that niche. But let me ask you this: with Oceanus, the way you're writing it, what if somebody wants to convert it to a uh, like a miniseries or a television yeah, well, I've, show? I've had tons of people um, say to me they want it to be a TV show. I mean that's right. I, I can't even tell you how many people I, I get here at all the time. It's like, this would be a great TV show. And then I'll go, okay, how do we do that? And they're like, why well, don't no, I? Well, no, 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 no. I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not oh, talking no, no, I'm about not saying the actual you. getting from A to B. Yeah, no, I'm not, talking, I'm, I'm not saying that to you. But I, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm just telling you the joke that I kind of go through and talk to people about it. Oh, okay, um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, I think one of the things we are looking at is the strategy. Um, you know, to look at this as, as some sort of, of series. What, I, what I'd like to do, though, is um, my goal with it would be to take it to um, a streaming service like a Hulu or an Amazon, you know, um, uh, maybe even a Netflix, although I think, I think Netflix is, is looking for much bigger ideas than what we're doing, you know. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, I think that, that the idea of <clears throat> maybe taking our, our script that we've got, you know, for the feature – and instead of making right. it into a uh, into a feature film, we turn it into episodes, an episodic TV show. That'd be really cool. You know, I, I, I'm open minded about it because I do think we have, in a lot of ways, what could be the next Star Trek. You know. Um, well, let me ask you this: you know, it, um, in, in with with the movie, with the script that you have for the movie, and don't give away anything that you don't want to give away. But with the script for the movie, at at the end of that script, when you come to the end of that the movie story. Is, is there room to continue? Because here's the deal. Oh, in real absolute, life, in oh, real oh, life, oh. life goes on. You know, no, it, and if, yeah. and if you're, oh no, it, it's absolutely written to to continue forward. There's no question that's oh, exactly right. what it's okay, designed good. to do. Oh no, it, it it ends with you going, "What is going to happen next? Where are they headed with this? What's the plan?" That's exactly right. what it's written. I mean, it, it perfect. It, it it there's there's no. <laughs> There's no way you could watch that feature film and not go, oh, well, what's going to happen? <laughs> you know, but, it, but what does happen is the main problem, the main issue that they were confronting does get solved, and you do find out what's really going on, and you do figure out kind of who the enemy is and what the potential problems are. And what, you know. So that, it, it's definitely a setup. So it, could it be a pilot for a show? Absolutely. It could be a fantastic right. pilot. So you, you've, got, you know? you've got a reveal, but you don't have, you don't have an ending. That's cool. That's right. good. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Oh, this will be great. I mean, Jeffrey, you, yeah, you should you. be you should be pretty happy with the way things are going to go because you know um, you, you've obviously thought of all the ideas, you covered all the bases, you know about you know about you know once you get it done and if you get a distributor, you know everybody gets paid, and then once it gets distributed, making a modest amount of money actually plays better for you than being one hit. If you do the, you know, if you all of a sudden blow up, then then there's a lot different pressures on you to do a lot, uh, you know, to make changes to your own successful model. That's the first thing that they want. As soon as they see you're successful, they tell you, oh, that was great. I mean, that was the best thing I've ever heard. Now, we want you to do the same thing, but, but j- just change these two little things. And it's like, what is wrong with you people? Exactly, exactly, because now, then you're ruining the thing that actually made it good in the first place. Exactly, you know, and and you know, you know it, 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 yeah, yeah, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. And that's, yeah, you, and that's get, you why. get these producers. You get these producers who who essentially want to pee on your work to partly make it theirs. Yeah, you know, oh, because no of their because of their egos and not because of the finances. Yeah, no question, no question, no question. Yeah, and Man. and it, it's yeah, exactly, and that's you know, and um, 
I, it's so it's so frustrating because it, it's it's uh, one of the things that I always feel is a challenge in this stuff is I never want it's it's not about ego for me, it's about vision, right? It's about going well. I have an idea and I want to take that idea from beginning to end. It's not about right. like I think I'm so great, you know, or whatever. It's not you know what I mean. It's not like it's not about serving an ego. It's about serving a vision and and being able to say I want to take that vision all the way, because you know and you know uh, when, when I when I think something through and I have an idea or creative impulse, I want to follow through on it all the way. And, right. And, and, right. and now, that's not to say, but as I, as I told you earlier, I'm very open to collaboration. I just want to collaborate with people who get it and who share the vision. Right. right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, you know, collaboration is fantastic. It, it, that's, the, that's the essence of great. I, that's part of why I like to write scripts with other people. So you can collaborate and go back and forth you know, instead of just kind of being in the weeds on your own. I think it's fine to do it on your own, but I, you know, but I like that, that tension of, of talking things through and solving problems. And one of the edicts I have with the other writers I work with at times is like, you can't ever destroy an idea or say an idea is no good unless you have a better one. You have to explain right. why the idea doesn't work, and then you have to have a better one to replace it. And that's for right. good writing. That forces good writing. You know, it, it, it's easy to just go, well, I think that sucks. Okay, well, why? I don't know. I just don't like it. Well, that's not, that's not, that's not productive. It's not constructive, you know. Um, you know, so so I'm, I want to be clear. I'm into collaborating. I'm into the idea of being able to, to build these things and to do this, but I don't want to do it in a way that destroys the vision. And that's what scares me about what I see happening with a lot of the Hollywood stuff is it's just like, well, you know, we, we – I'll give you an example. Okay, so think about the scene in Star Trek Into Darkness where um, – they're on the shuttle craft and all of a sudden Alice Eve, uh, who is Carol Marcus, suddenly is just in her underwear. Right. right. And I remember. Yeah. What, like, what was that all about? What, oh my God. That, I mean, it was, you know, it, it was like in, in, the, in the whole audience, I remember, I remember being in the theater when I saw that film and the audience was just like, it just kind of sucked the air out of the room. It was, nobody was like, Oh, that's awesome. No, that's hot. It was just like, everyone's like, what is that? I, you could see. And, it, and then they gave her the a stupid line. Turn around. You know, right, exactly. turn around. Right, yeah. right. It was just bizarre. And and see, that's what scares me about when you get to a $100 million budget or a $150 million budget. Does that make sense? Because if you think about it, that one scene of her in her underwear was suddenly now in every commercial. It was in the, it was in the ad campaign. It was, a, it's on the YouTube, you know, um, banner. It's, a, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, what does this have to do with Star Trek? What does this have to do with that character? What does this have to do with what are you doing? You know, well, well, I guess I guess they think that there's some 13 year old boy. I, I literally, I, I I sit there thinking, like, who's gonna go say, oh man, you know that movie, that new Star Trek movie? There's like a woman in her underwear in that, so <laughs> I, I gotta go see that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, wh- why do they think that works? I don't understand. I don't. I, I guess it must. Or they wouldn't do it. I guess I. I don't know. What What do you think? No, what no, no, you, no. You, you can't say that anymore. You can't say that anymore because you know what they make. They make you do all kinds of crazy ass stuff. Yeah. And 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 they don't care if it works or not. This goes back to my saying. You know, they decide. They tell you to do something so that they have peed on it, peed in the corner, and made it theirs. And and there is no sadder aspect of the studio system than that. And and so you know, for those who didn't listen last week, you're based in uh, near in the near the Minneapolis St. Paul area, and and you're not in you know you take a meeting in Hollywood, you'll oh, fly yeah. out Ooh. there, but you're yeah. but you're not going to stay there, you know because no. because uh, it, it it it's just too painful. It really is because you know what you want to you want to do good storytelling, mm-hmm. okay? You're not sitting there going, oh, I'm going to make a blockbuster. No, that's you know, not at all. You're, not you know, all. you're just not I mean, sitting there doing that. No, no I, what I will say is, um, and, and, and what I do take seriously, and this is something that I've really, really, uh, there's another side of this, is I do take the business side seriously. And I do recognize that there has to be an economic model to, for all this, right? That you have to, you, you can't just make movies for yourself and you can't just make, you know, it can't just be a passion project. I mean, there, there's money at stake. I have investors who did put money behind this and believed in me. And I and I want them to get a return for that, and I and that that I do take very seriously. But but they agree with me that we should not have to compromise the storytelling, our values, our morals, our perspectives to just make that buck. What we need to do is lean into that, lean into our values and morals and perspectives, and learn how to make a buck off of that. 
Does that make sense? Right. That's right. Great. And that's and that's the opposite of putting Alice Eve in her underwear for no reason in a scene. You know what I mean? It's like that, if you look at Oceanus when you watch the film, they both have the same uniform, right? I I intentionally <clears throat> class I, I intentionally cast a, a a an actress who was in her forties because I'm sick of uh, you know both of our actors are in their forties because I'm they're marine biologists and engineers and and you know something I just don't believe that super hot twenty something year old people. <laughs> Are, are the kind of folks who are going to end up having, you know, PhDs in, you know, marine biology. I just, you know, maybe they do, I guess, but, you know, it, it seems very unlikely to me, and it's very silly. And, you know, when I was a kid, I, a lot of the characters that I looked up to in movies and TV shows, some of them were in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I thought they were super cool characters, right? And I was right. like, I want to have characters and actors in here who I believe could actually have the pedigree to be in their role, right? Um, well, and, know, and there is... There's kind of a movement toward that. You know, you're, we're getting, you know, there's so much backlash about the stupidity of Hollywood casting. You know, it's starting mm-hmm. to catch up with the studios. And and I'll tell you right now, I, I never would have wanted to be a woman in Hollywood from the 60s to the 90s, you know. But but you're, but you're right. But it, let's, let's take a really good example. One of the most popular sci-fi series in the world is Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. And Peter Capaldi is like as old as dirt. All right. Um, well, okay. All right. Maybe not dirt. Maybe he's, he's as old as water. No, no, no. I take that back. Water came first, so dirt would be younger. But, but seriously, you know, he he is probably one of the finest character actors who has ever inhabited the role of Doctor Who. Sure. And and sure. so and so when when he is when he is performing, um, he brings a depth to that role that I'm not going to say that the other doctors were not as good. They all played their own roles, but he brings a certain, a certain um, depth to, to the acting, to the emoting, to, to saying but not saying, to showing and not telling that, that we don't normally see, and that's because of experience. So there's, there's nothing for you to – I mean, obviously, you, you cast the way you did because it makes sense for the story. And that's you right. didn't comp- you didn't compromise because of other people's expectations. So no. I mean, there's 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 no apology necessary. An explanation maybe when somebody says, "Well, well, well, why didn't you get? Why didn't you ask Lindsay Lohan to be the uh, to be the, the the marine biologist?" And and you know, instead of you having to do a face plant, you know, or or just walk out of the room. You're doing it the way you're doing it, but you're still going to turn out a good story. And that's essentially what you're hoping to do. You want to tell a story that people like you and me would want to go and see. You know, yes, exactly. It was like Robinson Crusoe on Mars was a great movie un- until we had the aliens, you know, mm-hmm. 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 Because, because it was science-based. Right. You know? Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, well, so we, and, and, you know, the first ahead. thing I was going to add that I was going to add to that is that I, um, you know, um, you know, the other thing that I was I was trying to do is I uh, I I put them both in the same uniform, right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't I didn't have the female version of the uniform. You know, like like oh, you know, well, let's put her in a low cut thing that lets you see some. You know, it's it's just like or well, cin- cinch up that waist or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like why? I, I, what? Because you wouldn't really do that. That's not you know. It's like our our did I did I cast two actors who were attractive, intelligent people? Sure, absolutely. Of course they did. You know. Um, right. I, I don't, you know, but I think that they also look like real people, and I also think that they that they they were not cast specifically because they were attractive. Does that make sense? It's, it's not. It's not like going. No, I no, no I, get you. no I, I get you. no, I get you. I get you. Yeah. On, yeah. Honestly, I get you, and I think that's. You know, it's going to be very interesting to see what the reviews and the comments are about your finished product project, because. You know, it, that's going to tell you a lot about how people were looking to, to see what you had. You know what I mean? What mm-hmm. what their expectations were that either a you didn't meet or b you you weren't you know your 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 effort wasn't worthy of because they're looking at you in a whole different way. And and that's just some some crap that you're going to have to go through. Um, but I I still think if you tell a great story, you know, even if, if okay, 2001: A Space Odyssey would not be a commercial success today. It would make it would probably make enough money to justify its budget. But but again, that's a pretty rarefied specialized audience. 
You know, it's not yeah. an audience. You know, you have a movie where you don't have any dialogue for the first 23, 25 minutes. You know, right. and, and so and so the fact that you didn't have that car crash or you didn't have, you know, the explosion or whatever, whatever, whatever these people are looking for is is going to make, you know, make people say certain things about you, you know, being a failure as a storyteller because people right. don't look that deep. But you know what? Um, d- despite the fact that Donald Trump is so popular with people out there, there's still a good amount of people who ha- who are cerebral enough or at least who are looking for entertainment that's more than just mental masturbation. Yeah. Ooh, am yeah. I allowed to say that? Yeah, I think I am. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, hold, hold on. Let me do this real quick. Uh, you're listening to the Genesis Science Fiction Radio Show, a service of the BlackScienceFictionSociety.com website. Um, for those who dropped in late or whatever, this is the uh, August, no, October 2nd edition. We're talking to Jeffrey Morris about um, about filmmaking and about the expectations of filmmaking. Um, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned that you've got Venus kind of waiting in the wings. Um, do, you, do you have several projects or several scripts or several ideas that you or you and your wife have kind of looked at working on that are, I mean, obviously they're going to be in the same vein, but do you do you have uh, do you have let's say do you have ten years worth of work ahead of you that, oh, yeah, that you planned out yeah yeah okay oh, yeah absolutely and, yeah no there's um there's Oceanus there's uh, Venus um there's another project that we developed a few years back called Slingshot which is about uh, it takes place in the Jupiter system deals with Europa and Jupiter's atmosphere it's a big adventure out set out in Jupiter it was really really exciting we 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 published it as a as an illustrated book. Um, back in 2009, 10, um, with uh, Buzz Aldrin actually wrote the foreword for me for the book, which was cool, and uh, mm-hmm. um, that's uh, um, that's one that I think we could also look at producing potentially. Um, you know, um, I keep talking to people about doing a multi-picture deal where we could do you know two or three of these type type movies. So the the one that I'm really really excited about um, is one that I've been developing that has to do with a, a new space race between Russia. I'm sorry, between China and the United States. Um, but it deals with, uh, uh, I don't want to give too much away about it, but it, 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 um, there's a, let's say that there's, there's something to do with a faster than light drive system that, that mm-hmm, could be mm-hmm. potentially out there and, and Russian, I just keep saying Russia. I, you know, I just got through watching the series, the Americans, um, which I really highly recommend actually. Um, and so Russia is kind of on my mind. Um, but anyway, the China and, uh, and the United States, in the near future have to go, they, they, they race each other, but then they eventually end up having to work together. And it's a pretty cool story. And I, my goal with this is actually to engage with, uh, through some of my, my space connections, I really want to work with the Chinese space agency and NASA and see if I can, if I can't, you know, unify the two to behind the effort to create this really cool movie. And that's the Mm -hmm, one movie mm -hmm. that I might make that might cost more than $25 million. It still shouldn't have to cost more than, I don't know, 30, 40 million, but that film is really the one that I think I'm destined to really, really create and that I think will really, really rock the world when I get that made. And it's, it's in the vein of what's happening with The Martian. It's going to be a really cool action-adventure story that's going to take us to a place, let's just say, that, um, that we just visited, <laughs> um, that, that was just imaged for the first time. Um, right. And, and I want to take us to that, that, that place that used to be called a planet and I want to I want to do an adventure there, and I want to um, um, I, and I want that story to be the basis of something that could become really become a new Star Trek. Really, you know, there, there's there's these years of Star Trek. I, I talked about that last week that we really didn't get to talk about, which is how did this all start? How did it all happen? How could something like that happen? And I'm not talking about Vulcans doing it or stopping by. I'm talking about human beings figuring it out and then deciding to you know travel between the stars. This would be the story that's about the genesis of that whole situation. So. That's that's a story that I've been working on steadily, and I'm going to start revealing more and more about it, you know, over the you know coming months and years, because that's that's a project that I want to really start. I'm going to try to fast track that as as into development once uh, once Oceanus is really up and running and happening. And I I already have been talking with some, um, I, you know, I was just in London. I met with some people who were from um, some of the Chinese. Uh, film production companies who had seen Oceanus and they really liked it. So I actually mm-hmm, think I can do this as a co-production with, uh, with some production companies in China. So it's a, well, it's and, a, and NASA yeah, is question. very cooperative. Yeah. NASA is very cooperative. I mean, uh, for my first book, I, um, I needed some information 
about the space shuttle, and I actually came up with a, 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 a means of getting a space shuttle in an emergency to get out into the lunar orbit. So I called up the head NASA librarian. I asked her a couple of questions, and she said, wait, 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 are you doing this for a book? I said, yeah. And she said, okay, tell me what, you're, tell me what you're, it is you want to look at. And I, I gave her the rundown of what I wanted to do with the shuttle. She said, okay, give me your number. And I said, okay. She said, I'll call you back in the next day or so. Like two days later, she called me back, and she said, oh, yeah, I talked to the engineers. And they said, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they actually look at things, and, and, and she said, and I feel very good about this, she said they were pretty excited that you were going to put this in a book. So, you know, hopefully you get the same cooperation out of the Chinese, and, and you know, you're right. Things like this can, can have a disproportionate effect that, that people would not realize, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, so... So that's another but project. That's you know that's, those are kind yeah. of my my top four projects right now that I'm playing around with and thinking about are you know um, uh, you know uh, Oceanus Venus slingshot and uh, and this uh, this Chinese project. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I you know but I've got an IP catalog of about thirty ideas that I've developed over the years and um, some of them I'm going to just like I said earlier package and um, and sell them too. So which I think would be cool. Yeah, I hate I hate to break this to you, but you know I already covered the invention of faster than light travel in in my in my book series. Um, okay. okay. The, the real no nonsense way that it could happen. So uh, I, I'm I'm perfectly willing to license the idea for like you know a dollar. Okay. We'll talk <laughs> later. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, yeah. you know why 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 am I going to break the bank? You know I know you want to keep your budget low, so I figure that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, and then uh, let's see. I did drop in. We dropped in the uh, the link earlier. Yeah, um, Jarvis dropped the link in to uh, to check out Oceanus. And for those who are listening to this as a podcast and did not see this, uh, uh, did not listen to this live, uh, what you want to do is you want to go to Future Dude F U T U R E D U D E dot com slash film. Uh, dash TV slash Oceanus, if you want to uh, to check out the um, <clears throat> the short. Um, do you, uh, and then basically that tells them where to look for things happening. Well, something I would like to ask you to do, you know, because you you do travel around, you show up weird places. Do you do any conventions or anything like that? Uh, you know, we were Comic Con this year uh, and last year. Um, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we're going to be, I don't know if anybody hears, we're going to be at the Twin Cities Film Festival showing the film here later in October, uh, I think the 30th. Um, and then the, Do um, me a favor. Sure. Uh, do us all a favor, actually. If you, you know, when you have uh, events where you're going to be, you know, either showing or doing something, um, drop into uh, blacksciencefictionsociety.com and put them on the events calendar. Because, okay. like, if, 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 if I see that you're going to be doing something up there, and I can convince the sheriff to let me have the ankle bracelet off for the weekend or whatever. Um, I, I it, you know, coming up there for the weekend to check something out is is no big deal. Um, sure. But anybody anybody who's where you're going to be, let's say you go to Comic Con and people know that they can check you out there, um, put put those put those events and put your travel up on the um, events calendar because. People do travel. People do run into each other all the time. You know, uh, Jarvis goes to Detroit. I don't know why, but he goes there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but that that would help, and that also keeps you know you've got a, a kind of like a, an audience of a few thousand, you know, almost five thousand people here, and you never know. I mean, you're you're very facile at using networking, and you never know who you're going to run into, and you never know how things may turn out. Um, so if you if you just think about that, because you know I I would come. It, you know, like uh, Kevin Wilmot, who did um, Destination Planet Negro, he had uh, he had a showing at the Gene Siskel Film Center here in Chicago. So I interviewed him actually the um, the weekend before he had the show, and then I went down and I met him. Um, so at least you have an affinity audience here, and I think this is an affinity audience that you're looking for because these are the kind of people who are going to go see your movie. Um, so just let us know where you are, and then that way we can check you out. 
Sure, um, no problem. No no. problem. Hey, I have a quick question for you. The uh, I noticed you guys have two different pages. Do you guys have one both of the Black Science Fiction Society pages on uh, on Facebook? There's, um, there's Jarvis, Jarvis handles both of those pages, but if you okay. go to the main site, that's where the okay. uh, obviously post in, in both places if you're going to be someplace. But the events calendar gives people a place to go. You know, like if somebody has a weekend, they're going to be in New York. They get to see if somebody's doing something in New York, so we can show up. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. for here in Chicago, we had C two E two, and a few people managed to get together for that. Yeah, we were there in 2014. We we uh, we we had a booth. We have our booth there for 2014. Actually, C two E two. That was a that was a nice. That was a good. Uh, that was a good show. That was a that was a really positive, um, friendly crowd. Really, um, right. really cool crowd. You know, that was that was awesome. I mean, it's uh, and and next time yeah. you come, I'll buy you lunch. Okay, all right. No, I'm serious. Oh, I'm serious as a heart attack because you know what? I like to meet all these people. Um, sure. And and you're you know we, I think we have an affinity. I I can't wait to see your stuff. Um, I I'm a lot more mainstream than you because uh because of the people I work with, but. But the goal is the same. You want to tell a good story that entertains people and, and makes them want to see more. And I think that that's the best I can do. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So, um, awesome. If you had – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm done. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you had, um, if, if you had some advice to tell somebody right now about your journey, and, and you know, I want you to tell – I would like for you to describe – the best part of doing what you're doing for other people, what it is that gives you the most amount of joy and what you've learned along the way that was positive. And then, and then, you know, later I'm going to ask you about, well, we've already talked about, you know, kind of the the difficulties working with um, studios, but, but for what you do, what's the, what's the, the joy, what's the, what's the thing that really trips your trigger and makes you want to do it? You know, the, 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 the most fun part, of movie making for you? Oh, well, okay. I think that um, the thing I like the most about Oceanus, for example, I watched it I watched it a couple weeks ago when it launched on Amazon Prime. Right. And the thing that was so exciting to me because I had a great team, we had a good script, I had good actors, I had this, this mojo happening. It was working, you know, the mojo happened, right? We'd all work to gel that I can watch that film and because I, I I I paid attention to the details, I took it really seriously. We had fun, we had a lot of fun on the set. It was not like it was a super serious dark place. It's really, you know, we're very professional, but we have a lot of fun. Um it was it the fact that I can watch that movie and I still like there are very, very little that I change. Like I don't watch it and go, oh man, that sucks or oh man, I wish there was and so for me, I feel like that is a that is the tribute to being able to pull together the right team. Does that mm-hmm, make sense? Mm-hmm. So having the right team and having that gel leads to something that you can actually be proud of. I've watched that movie dozens of times now, and I never get tired of it. And I also am very I, – I remain proud of it. I never get tired of it, and I don't find things that I want to change. So that tells me we did it right. You know, and that and, and there there was there I'd never had a project like that before that. You know, where I wasn't like, ah, gosh, you know, if I only had, had some more money, ah, shoot, if I, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it, I, it's it's uh, it was the first time I had enough money, and and I will say the same thing about Parallel Man. If you ever get a chance to see the animation, both of those okay. are are really close to about ninety nine percent the vision I had. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really exciting. And so to get to see a vision that was in your head and have that actually come out on the screen because you pulled together the right team of people and you were able to do the business side of it so that you were able to raise enough money. Because, my gosh, if I had not had enough money, and I, that's where I have to thank my investors for really believing me and backing me. And when I had to come back to them a few times, <laughs> more than once, and go, you know, I think I'm going to need a little more. Uh, you know, I think we're going to need maybe just a little more, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. They, but they they were never like, what the hell are you doing? They were like, you know what, this is looking pretty good. You're doing a great job. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's keep, let's make this happen. You know, so that's, that's what's exciting about it. And so what I would say to anybody who wants to make movies, um, it's, it's, it's about having a clear vision of what you want and sticking to it. But it's also about having a business foundation 
you, you, you have to make sure you have the resources to enact your vision. If you can't pull those resources together, you'll never be able to pull it off, right? And it will <clears> always end up just being kind of good enough. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, well, I don't know. We can only make that. Could, you, you've seen our set, right? If, if I had to make that set out, of, you know, I, I, I met with other people to talk about the design of that set. And there are people who said to me, um, you know, what you want to do is kind of impossible and it'll cost too much money. Well, I was like, well, I'm not, right. instead of me going and, and, and making a cheap set, I said, I'm going to go find somebody who can make the set that I want to build. Right, Does that make right. Sense? You know what I mean? So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but these are the things that I think Well, no, about. I mean, the, the message yeah. that you just gave is don't settle. That's the yeah. other thing. Don't settle. You know, if, mm-hmm. if, you, if, you, if you have a vision that you really believe in, then, then there's no reason for you not to go for your unless it's complete. I mean, unless it's completely nuts. Oh, I'd like to have real weightlessness on our on our set. Well, yeah, yeah, well, that's probably not going to happen. You know, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah. But but and, 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 and you know, but, obviously, there's things. There are things that I did have to that I couldn't. I couldn't just do everything. You know, what? Okay, here's here's something that's very interesting. You also have to know when to compromise because I I had things in my head like there were a couple shots I was going to do where the camera was going to be outside the submarine. And it was going right. to push in through the glass and all the way back to where our character was unconscious. And I was going to have you know, okay. start off with, with a CG shot of the sub rotating and floating underwater and, and, right. and it's upside down. And then the camera was going to slowly push in through the glass and then up to her. And we realized that was going to take a half a day to set up that shot. And we were like, is it really worth a half day for this scene? which is in some ways, it's kind of a show-off shot. It's not really necessary. Why am I doing it? And then, so I thought about it. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have her laying there on the, on the ground. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. I'm gonna, what I am going to do is invest in a camera head that can make the, can, the scene roll, where, where we can right. make it look like the submarine's rotating. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to time it out. And I talked her through the scene, and it ended up looking great. It actually worked better than it would have worked if we'd done the expensive, time-consuming thing. And so there, that happened three times on this, on this movie where I was like, you know, I don't have to do that big, expensive show-off thing. I don't need to do that. You know, it's right. more important that I focus on what I have to do to, to sell the theme and, and make it work than try to show off as a filmmaker. And that was another well, thing that I, you know, yeah. That, that boils down to realistic expectations. You know, there there's some people who will stamp their little foot and go, no, I want it this way no matter what, and and sometimes it just doesn't call for that. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah I uh, I I I got uh, I got lucky kind of like you because of the people around me. Um, I wanted to do a production trailer for the um, the the Chicago Job Bank Heist movie, and so I got I got my production team together, and so, you know. Some some of us are actors, some are not. I'm not an actor at all. But we went and we shot this production trailer, and then we, we, we went back and did a budget behind it so that we could get everybody paid and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. um, essentially, we, we did uh, like $85,000 of work for this uh, 11-minute trailer, and we we actually did it for $320 worth of food. So, sure. so that's... You know, but but that that goes back to what you said earlier about putting together a good team and people who believe in what you're doing. Um, exactly. And and there's there's really no substitute for that. There's no, you know, you can't you can't even put. You, how do you budget for that? You can't. You know, you're you just you just are fortunate that you you build the relationships with those kind of people. So. Yeah. Um, I I'm not sure how much longer you want to talk. Um, but I mean, we've pretty much covered all. Of, I mean, just about every possible thing we can, and I'm I'm really happy that you were able to come back and do the part two of of the show because uh, you know I apologize for the technical difficulties last week, but man, no, they were they were, mad, they were maddening for us, and I'm I'm glad you're willing to come back. Um, if if uh, yeah, if if you would keep us posted at the main site of of the milestones you're hitting. Um, and and also drop the things on Facebook that that we were used to seeing. That would sure. be great because I I think your project is is a good one to follow, and I think that people who pay attention to how you're getting your project done are are going to end up knowing more about process than they could learn any other way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's that's pretty important. And then the other part, 
you know, that I would like to, you know, if we ever have you back, well, no, we will have you back, but the next time that we have you back, um, once you're through this project, the thing that I want to, want to concentrate on is the business of doing business because oh, that's, the part that most, that, that's the part that most creatives have the toughest time um, wrapping their head around because it, it's, a, it's a much different environment than, you would, than one would suspect. So here's what I'll that. do. Here's, here's what I would love to do, okay? Okay. If, if you have people, I, I want to know that there are people out there that are listening to this and that are interested. That's the first thing. But if there are folks out there who, will, who want to hear about the business side of this, we could do one more session of these things and talk about it someday. We don't have to do it, you know, in, I know you've got other people. Right, no, no, I get you. Stuff. I get you. But, 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 but here's my thing. The business of yeah. this stuff is actually the most important part of it, and it's the part that, that nobody wants to talk about. And it's the part that creatives, and I'm telling you, I have met so few creative people who can get their brains around it, and, and they will never succeed unless they do. And, and Because I right. tell you, the business side of this thing is the number one part. If without it, it, literally, for me, I have spent the last five months of my life doing nothing. Okay, I wrote some scripts. I did some design work and stuff like that, but honestly – uh, about 80%, 90% of my time has been working with investors, working with budgets, working with finance, working with accountants, working with attorneys, uh, uh, you know, understanding the industry. It's all that stuff working with, with how am I going to finance this? How am I going to do the sales? How am I going to, you know, that's the stuff that actually allows the movie to be made. And if I don't do that stuff, so what? It, I, I'll never get a chance to actually make that film, you know? So that's, right. that's the part that's really hard. And, and, you know, I have people contacting me all the time going, can you make my movie? I'm like, no, but I can probably talk to you a little bit about how you can make your movie, you know? Right. Um, you know what I mean? But it's like, it, it's, um, but they got to be willing to do the, do that work. It's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And it, and it gets frustrating. And there are days that I go, man, all I wanted to do was make a damn movie, <laughs> you know? But, and, but, and I'm sitting but, here, but you know? see, that's, that goes back, back to what I call the 80, 20 rule. You know, mm -hmm. 20% of what you do is creative and, yeah. and 80% of what you do is 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 the business of doing business. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of people don't get that. And and even you know it's the same thing for writers. It's the same thing for comic book creators. It's the same thing for artists. You know, yeah, you're great at doing your art, but you have become an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. Well, and, and so, also in the last in the last you know, two years um, since, since I got, you know, I, I got this company off the ground in 2010. Um, and, uh, but, but over that time period, I, I have employed and I have paid salaries and, and, and paid contractors. I mean, I've, I've worked with, you know, uh, well over a hundred contractors. I've, I've, uh, I've had employees. I have people, I have a, a regular staff that works with me full time that I, you sure. know, I pay for their, their health and their benefits. I pay for, you know, and, and I mean, you know, we, I have empowered people to have, careers and to have employment, you know, so there's that aspect that I'm very, very happy about, you know, I'm very proud of that. And, um, you know, so it, it's something that's, that's part of what it takes to get this done, you know, so it's, it's uh, at the end of the day, I got to be a business guy. I, unfortunately, no, I'm, I'm, I used to, I had to decide, am I going to be a pre creative guy who deals a little bit of something about business or a business guy who knows a lot about creative? And that's what I've had to do. I've had to become a business guy who knows about creative. So like I said, well, if you ever want to do a show about that, we could talk about it for yeah, we'll we'll do that next time, and maybe maybe what we'll do is uh, maybe I'll be in pre-production by then, and I can I can tell people a little bit. You know, we could maybe we could get uh, the two of us to talk about that, or or even maybe someone else. So um, obviously that that would be a great show. We don't have to do it right away. Um, and and where are you in the pre-production part of the Oceanus feature? Well, the um. You know, we've done, uh, we've, uh, let's see, we have, um, we've done, uh, I, I'm sorry about that, I had a call come in. Um, we've, uh, um, we've got the script done, got the budget done, right. got the schedule done, right? right? We're, we, uh, we, we're doing casting, we, we have our fingers crossed, we're actually hoping to get, uh, I'll, you know, I'll do a shout out, we're hoping to get Tommy Lee Jones from our movie, <laughs> you know. Um, we're, we're working on him, someone like a Tommy Lee Jones or Jeff Bridges for, for a film. We'll see what happens, but I think we've got a good shot. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, we, uh, we're working with casting people. There are some discussions that happened this week with that. Um, we're really working on the financing stuff. We've done, we've done designs, the, the, uh, the this primary submarine in the film. It's called the Hydros. 
Um, right. And the hydros, uh, the chip I designed, and that that's done. And uh, um, the hydros is designed, and the uh, um, the interiors of the hydros have been designed for the most part. We still have one more set to do there. Um, so we almost have all the sets designed at this point. We almost have all the set designs done. There's several, several vehicles we still have left to do. We've got to design some combat drones and underwater um, robots and things like that. Sure. That still have to be done. Um, that stuff's still there. So we've probably got another couple of months of pre-pro design, actual physics, you know, actual design. Um, mm-hmm. But we're, we're pretty far along, actually, in terms of we, we know what we're doing. We know, we know what we want it to look like. We've got production paintings still have to do with storyboards. And I'm, I'm going to be tapping a guy named Christian Gossett, who's a fantastic comic book artist who did a series called The Red Star. He's going to be doing our, our storyboards for the film. So, you know, so we've got a great plan. It's just, right now I'm focused on getting the money. You know, I'm getting the mm-hmm. money. <laughs> so that's, that's where I am. I've had to kind of shift from, from making the film to funding the film. So, I'm, but I'm hoping that, that within the, in the coming weeks we'll be able to shift back. And certainly before the end of these, this year we'll be able to get back to pre-production hard and really uh, take it all the way. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, let me let me thank you for, for coming back, uh, you know, and finishing up. And uh, we will talk in the future. I've, I've, it's been a blast for me. I mean, this has been one of the easiest shows I've ever done because um, I, I love the things that you talked about. And, and, and you brought a lot of information to the people who normally listen to this show. Um, and, and, and thank you for doing what you do because, you know, it's, it's tough enough as it is to, to be a creative. And it's certainly tough enough to do film, but to be able to stand back and say, no, no, this is the way I want to do it. This is what I'm looking to do. This is the story I want to tell. And to make it stick is not always an easy thing. So I, I think that uh, I think that what, what you've told our people, what, what this show has, uh, has brought to the fore is, is exactly what it takes to not only do well, but to do well on your own terms. So, um, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for stopping in. And uh, see, now now I got to go use my Amazon Prime and check out the movie. I'm really excited. Let me know. Let me know what you think of it. And also, can you guys make sure that you you give me these links because I I feel like this has been a really fun interview and uh, I like the direction. I like how it's gone. And you know, I think anybody who really wants to understand kind of the how and the why um, of what I'm doing, I think this interview gives a really good taste of that. And, and, it, and, and I understand the length of it now because it gives us a chance to really talk about it. So it's cool. It's awesome. I appreciate well, it. You know, I want to thank you guys. I'll, I want to thank you guys. You know. Well, thank you. I, 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 I'm just happy that uh, I tricked you into doing more than 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Not a problem. Not a problem. Um, all right. Yeah. No, no, no. The, um, uh, this, will be, this will be up on two places. This will be up on the, uh, the talk shoe page. And mm-hmm. also, you know, we do have the um, – uh, we have a YouTube page for the Genesis Science Fiction radio show. So uh, we'll, we'll drop you links to both of those because I think, um, I, I, you know, a lot of people, you know, when we book them, they go, well, I, I don't have that much to talk about. But everybody right. has that much to talk about because when you're, when you're talking about the work that you do and, and if you're passionate about what you do, it, it's not hard to to really bring to bring it so that other people see exactly who you are and what what you've done and and the things that you've gone through to, to be there. So if if you did like the interview, obviously you'll be able to go ahead and link to it. Um, I would probably link to the YouTube um, yeah, page for sense. this one show because that way people don't have to go through on the talk show page and look at the whole index of all the shows that we've done. So sure. yeah, we'll we'll get that information to you and and. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much. It, this has been a joy for me, and I really appreciate um, you spending the time. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, and uh, you guys. And, uh, and you know what? Best of luck to you. If I have to drop off a bunch of computer stuff up in uh, uh, not Eden Prairie, a uh, Shoreview, Shoreview up there. Uh huh. And maybe maybe I'll drop you a note, and maybe we can have lunch. Sure. That sounds good. Looking forward to it. That'd be, that'd All right, be great. and um, I think uh, I think Jarvis is on the road. I'm not sure where he is. Yeah, I think he is. But I want to thank everybody who listens. I want to thank everybody who helps make this show possible. I want to thank people who picked this up as a podcast. And um, uh, all the people who are creatives who help make, you know, some very fun things happen, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, again, thank you to our special guests. Jeffrey Morris, um, 
drop in uh, BSFS, check out his appearances there, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Jeffrey? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I didn't know if that was you signing off. <laughs> No, no. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're going to call this uh, call it a day, and um, I'm going to put a, a, a blank pause in there. Uh, give us about five seconds of silence, and then that way, that's where they'll cut off the show. And then, if you can okay. hang around just for a couple more minutes, I got a couple things I want to talk to you about. Is that okay? Sure, no problem, no problem. Hey, also, I want to give a shout out to everybody who's listening. If you want to go to know more about what we're doing and who we are, uh, check out futuredude.com. Right. Yeah, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, but that's good. Yeah, futuredude.com. Okay. And then they can find you on Facebook, uh, also doing, you know, just looking up Future Dude. Yes, that's correct. Yep. All right. So uh, on behalf of everybody who makes uh, BlackScienceFictionSociety.com happen, uh, thank you, everybody. We will be back next Friday with another exciting guest. And uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. You guys take care.